Hello everyone, my group and I will be discussing the topic of memory distortion. So first, what is memory distortion? Memory distortion occurs when the retrieval of memories is inaccurate and remembered in an inconsistent way from what correctly transpired. More specifically, it encompasses just based errors to which individuals falsely remember similar information and source misattributions where individuals correctly remember some pieces of information, but incorrectly associate the remembered information with a specific instance. Memory distortion is a universal experience due to the fact that events are unable to be encoded for exact memory. So we all experience some type of memory distortion. Um, so memories are able to be distorted by various factors, such as schemas, source amnesia, and misinformation effects. However, the focus of this video is the effect of eyewitness testimony convictions through the influence of misinformation and false memory and memory distortion. The misinformation effect is memory from past events that is altered after exposure to misleading information. This misinformation can be introduced via leading questions asked by the police or other people after an event has occurred, such as the example below where participants in a study were asked to choose between two pictures and decide which one they saw after receiving verbal misinformation. This information can then become part of the original memory through semantic integration therefore creating a false memory. I'm gonna go over errors of reconstructive retrieval. So there's leveling, which represents the loss of details and which this also represents the minor details. There's also assimilation, which represents a recollection of memory that's normalized to fit with pre-existing ideas. And there's also sharpening, which helps remembering details that were never stated, but were inferred by general knowledge. So when we create memories, we tend to have errors of encoding those memories. So an example of an error when encoding memory would be selection. Selection is selective encoding of information that fits prior knowledge. So selection revolves around similar ideas that fit with a, an appropriate schema. Another example would be interpretation. So interpretation is new material that is made to conform to activated schemas. Interpretation would be an activated schema through an experience that influences how we interpret that specific experience. And then another um, example of an error of encoding memories would be integration. So integration is features of different events that are combined into a unified memory representation. So an example of integration would be if I said the hill was steep and then I asked the question, what was? To which you guys would decide what the new and old information is so the longer the question gets, the more information I give you, the more idea units um, there are. So the more difficult it would become to remember. Okay, so now we're gonna talk about how constructive processes or how we encode and retrieve memories influence the accuracy of eyewitness, eyewitness testimony. So first we're gonna talk about selective encoding. Eyewitnesses can experience stress that cause failure to encode events. And whatever information is encoded during emotional stress is likely to be stored in long-term memory. So for example, if, um, if a perpetrator is holding a weapon like a gun or a knife, the witness is likely to be um, focusing more on that rather than the face, which means it'll be um, harder for the perpetrator's face um, to be encoded in the memory and for the witness to um, identify that person later on. Now we're going to be talking about misidentifications in lineups. So misidentifications can occur if conditions of the lineup work against the eyewitness. Um, so for example, if there is a lineup and none of the people in the lineup fit the description of what the witness gave except for one person, but that one person is innocent, it is still likely for that person to be picked as um, you know, the perpetrator because they are the only person that fits the description. Um, and additionally, people tend to attend more to faces of people of their own race. So what that means is white people will be more likely to correctly identify white people, Black people will be more likely to identify Black people, and etc. 
Now, outside influences. So the misinformation effect, um, questions with misleading information can distort memory. And for implanted memories, false memories can be created through suggestions and questions by outside influences. So what this means is that um, if someone like police or whatever was, is questioning a witness to try to get more information from them, if they are not careful with the way they are wording things, um, or, or if their questions or statements are pointing towards a certain direction, trying to imply something, then that can make it more likely for the witness to, um, you know, plant false memories in their own head. Okay, so now we're going to take everything we just talked about and apply it to a real world example that has happened. Um, so I just want to give a quick trigger warning. Um, we are going to be talking about rape and assault. Um, so if you are uncomfortable with any of that, I would suggest stepping away for maybe, um, you know, a minute or two, skip until I'm past like a two or three slides. Um, so first, the background information for this specific example. Jennifer Thompson is a woman who was raped at knife point and... Um, Later, she misidentified her rapist and she sent an innocent man, Ronald Cotton, to prison for nearly 11 years for a crime he did not commit. And this happened because um, when she was looking at the first photo lineup that was shown to her, her real rapist was not in that lineup. But Ronald Cotton was there and he was the one out of the lineup who fit the description the most. So later on, when she was shown a second lineup, in-person lineup, um, Ronald Cotton was in that lineup as well, and her real rapist was also in that lineup. She still chose Ronald Cotton as her rapist because um, she had already had it in her mind that he was the one. So she did not pick her real rapist when she was shown a second lineup. So where things could have gone wrong with this specific instance, first, conditions of the lineup worked against the eyewitness. Um, that, um, that just means for that first photo lineup, um, her real rapist was not there, um, and but Ronald Cotton was there and he fit the description. So it was easy for her to misidentify. Um, second, selective encoding. Um, emotional duress, obviously being raped is a horrible traumatic experience. The stress that she experienced, um, you know, could have caused issues with correctly encoding memory um, and retrieving memory. Um, and focus on weapon rather than perpetrator's face. She was raped at knife point, so it's possible that she could have been focused on the weapon, on the knife, rather than on, um, you know, the person's face. And lastly, other race identification, Jennifer Thompson is a white woman and um, her rapist was a black man, Ronald Cotton was a black man and everyone in the lineup was a black man. So it might've been easy for her to misidentify because um, you know, they are not of the same race. Um, and you can just see a little picture of Ronald Cotton and Jennifer Thompson after you know, the situation was figured out when he was freed. Um, and yeah. Impacts of memory distortion on people. As a result from the Jennifer Thompson trial, there have been changes to how police officers present suspects to victims. Police officers now present suspects sequentially. So that means one after the other instead of simultaneously, which means all at once. This is more effective because when suspects are presented simultaneously, as shown in the cartoon, it's easier for victims to confuse traits of the criminal for somebody else. It's better to show victims sequentially so that they can prevent confusion and false memory accounts. Because of the mistakes made through eyewitness testimonies, many professionals are starting to question the accuracy of these testimonies. The number of wrongfully accused criminals in America is between 2 to 10%, which is around 46,000 to 230,000 people. This is an alarmingly high percent of people, and because of this, there are new methods under review to change the process of eyewitness testimonies. <laughs> 